Hello, thanks so much for joining us. If you read TechCrunch, you see a lot of success stories about raising VC, so hopefully we can have an honest conversation around how you actually do that and what it takes to be successful raising venture capital. Um, I'd like to start with um, a brief introductions from you guys. Maybe you could just quickly 10 seconds say what stage you're investing at and your founder, what your company does. Cool. Great. Annie? Okay, I'll go ahead and start. My name is Annie Cadaby. I work at Redpoint Ventures, and I focus on um, early stage, primarily um, Series A. Charles Hudson, managing partner at Precursor Ventures. We focus primarily on pre-seed and seed investing. Uh, Russ Huddleston, co-founder and CEO at Docsen. So I'm the kind of the other side of the table. My my second startup. Then, um, yeah, do some seed investing on the side and a lot of startup advising. Thank you for keeping that short. So I think everyone wants to know first things first. What kind of company needs to raise VC? And why don't we start with you, Charles, since you're seeing tons and tons of very, very early stage companies. I think venture capital, it's really a specialty type of capital. It's really for companies that have the aspiration to grow really quickly, to build really large businesses. And I think increasingly where you think you're going and after an opportunity that could produce a company that's worth hundreds of millions or increasingly for the largest funds in our industry, billions of dollars in outcome. And I think the two, to me, most salient points about that are high growth, because if you're not a company that needs to grow quickly, venture capital might not be the right source of capital for you, and large opportunity. There has to be a really big prize at the end of the journey. How do you know if you're not a high growth company? It's a really interesting question. I don't think it's easy to answer. The way I think about it is there are some businesses that have basically no competition, medium-sized market. And if you, didn't go, if you didn't grow quickly, you'd probably still win because it's not that competitive. So I think there are some markets that are winner take all, where whoever ends up winning, whether it's because there's network effects or there's something about the nature of that business that the person who gathers up the most customers in the early days is really well positioned to win and has an unfair long-term advantage. Those are businesses that are great for venture capital because picking up those users. So think about a social network. You know, If you can be the one that gets the most people on it, early that creates positive momentum and it becomes hard to break in. Those kinds of businesses can be great for venture capital. But there's other businesses where sometimes people come to me and they say, we've been growing 10% a month for the last year. We're really excited about that growth. And I would say, well, that's really good growth. High growth is usually more than that and for a sustained period of time. So it is really subjective. And I think mm -hmm. that's the hardest part about raising money is that what's fast to me might not feel fast to the entrepreneur. So as a VC reporter, I've been hearing a lot of like, Founders raising at the pre-idea stage. What is the pre-idea stage? And Annie, you can answer this one. And when do you think is the best time actually to go out and raise your first round? Uh, so again, it depends on the type of business. So the, the pre-idea phase, I guess, would be exactly that, right? It's, it's a person that knows that he or she wants to go start a company. And quite frankly, they should be talking to somebody like Charles. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they might not know exactly what that is. And so I think that that's something over the course of the last maybe five or seven years has become much more common. Uh, and so there have been more investors that have come in this stage. There have been um, like spaces and communities of people that are all kind of working on their own ideas together, which is, I think, a really kind of encouraging environment to go start a company. Um, and, the, you know, the point is that you're basically doing your homework on researching some different business models, different markets, different go to markets. You're maybe meeting a co-founder or a set of co-founders. And some people decide to raise a bit of money then in a pre-seed round. Um, and depending on what the company is that you want to build or the kind of types of categories that you're looking at, I would assume it would make more sense to raise a little bit of money then. Alternatively, we do see companies that don't raise a pre-seed or even a seed round and the first time that they go out to raise institutional capital is for something that looks like a Series A. And at that point, they've bootstrapped it typically. Um, and they can do that for one of two reasons. One is that they have the personal capital or friends and family that are going to help them fund their way. That is the exception, not the rule. Um, and the other way that we often see companies um, achieve that is that they have a really beautiful cash flow business where they've been able to make money and cycle it back into the business very quickly so that they've been able to grow without raising outside capital. And why are we seeing more and more of that? You said in the last five years, you've been seeing more- More pre-seed? More, more founders being funded, I guess, without, ha yeah. At, so early on, they don't have a ton to show for their business, yet they're able to raise venture capital. I'll take a cut at it, and then I'll kick yeah. it to you, actually, because yeah. I think Charles is, maybe you go first, actually, because Charles is I, one who meets all of these I people. I think the biggest cases. difference is now, maybe five years ago, 
it didn't feel like every company bought software. Like software companies bought software from other software companies. And now I see more and more companies that are selling a vertical software solution to an industry that previously five years ago wasn't thought of as a software consumer. So I've seen companies in hospitality, in art, in all, any, you think about any vertical market in SMB, there's probably an entrepreneur out there who's bootstrapping a business to sell them a CRM product, an inventory management product, something to communicate with their customers on the sales and marketing side. And also, you don't have to get on a plane to go find customers anymore. You can find them through online channels. And so I think you've got, on the cost side, you've got cheaper access to customers through marketing. You've got cheaper access to technology through AWS and Google Cloud. You've got, I think, more businesses that need software as part of their equation. So you have customers that probably never had a line item for software spend five years ago who now go, oh, we use MailChimp to email all of our customers, and we use some lightweight CRM system, or we use Stripe for billing. And so software is just more a part of everyone's business, which means if you're a clever entrepreneur with either relationships in an industry or an insight, you can start finding all of the dry cleaners in America and build the dry cleaner customer relationship management solution. And you could find all these dry cleaners online probably through Facebook ads, and you could probably communicate with them on MailChimp, and you could build them on Stripe. So it's a lot cheaper and easier to get started. And some of these niche businesses that you probably would have had to go convince me or Annie to give you $2 million to start, you don't need to do that anymore. Well, Russ, why don't you tell us a little bit about Doxen's fi financing history, and, and at what point you realized, I need to raise VC for this? Yeah, sure, and there are two answers to that. One is the view I bring from Docs, and just because we have so many companies that use us for fundraising, and we've done some really interesting yeah. research around that, like in the aggregate, what we see, and then there's also just my experience personally with that. I'd say on the, the personal side with raising money or not, I agree with everything Charles said about costs are coming down, more companies are buying software, but the flip side of that is you have an increasing amount of competition. So as a founder, if you're thinking about do I raise or not raise, like there are a couple of reasons that I will often advise people to, to raise early. Um, one is if they're really stressing about buying a whiteboard for their office or like some relatively small cost. Like if you think it could be a big company and you're stressing about small things like raise money, buy the whiteboard, hire the additional person and get back to what you should be doing, which is running your business and growing it quickly. Um, the other thing is that if you get worried that someone else comes along, has this insight, and raises before you do. Like if you ask the question, is there a competitor? I don't know about, and if I heard tomorrow they just raised $2 million or five or $10 million, like how nervous would that make me? And for some businesses you're like, I don't really care. It's a services industry. It's not a winner take all. And other times you're like, uh oh, I'd be really nervous. So if either of those two apply, that's a good reason to like, now you probably have enough information and enough evidence to make a compelling case to someone like Charles and you probably want to make it happen sooner rather than later, and that's a good time to raise money. So we're already getting a lot of audience questions, so I want to make sure we, we do get to those. I'm going to just jump into one right now. Um, I'm a first-time founder, and I've gotten quite a lot of pressure to find a co-founder from investors. Do you invest in single founders, and what's the concern? Should I take it? I can, yeah. I'm happy to take it. We invest in a lot of single founders, and my philosophy on this has like, changed quite a bit in the last 10 years. My biggest concern with solo founders is, are you on your own because you can't inspire, recruit, or play nicely with others? And if that's the case, then that has all kinds of implications for the size of the company you can build. I think there's one really nice thing about being a solo founder is that you have so much in your cap table to give to your early employees. You can make offers to those first few hires that are way out of market. So we've had companies where the first founder has been non-technical and they've been able to give their first technical hire 15 or 20 points of the company, which no one else in the market is going to be able to match that person. And the flip side is we've had companies where the co-founder was usually the technical person was, they had a ceiling and that person was not destined to be the CTO of that company long term, but we had 35 or 40 points of the cap table tied up in that individual and it really constrained our ability to bring in really senior talent early. So I think as long as I understand, like, hey, if you had the idea, there was no one else around in that moment of inception, you, or you didn't want to start it with someone, as long as it's not a reflection of your ability to recruit and work with others, I don't have any issue with it. Yeah, and by the time it gets to a Series A stage, where most often, probably nine out of 10 times, the company has raised a bit of capital before, there is a team around that person and around that product. And so if it's one founder versus two or three or four at the beginning, um, 
I don't think that we actually have much of a preference because at that point they've kind of proven mm -hmm. Charles's first point, which is they can bring a group of people around them to help build the company. There's one more thing I'll add. It's really stressful being a solo founder because you don't have anybody to modulate your mood. So if you're having a bad day, the company's probably having a bad day. And when you have a co-founder, at least you have someone to modulate your mood when things get really tight. And so when we do have solo founders, we work really hard to make sure that they have a really good external emotional support system to kind of help keep them balanced and grounded. Are you a solo founder? No, I have two co-founders. And I get this question a lot as well. It's often uh, people will ask that question after they've I had an idea, they'll like work a little bit on it, and then they're thinking about fundraising, and then they get this pushback around it. And that's really right on the cusp. Like, if you can raise money, if you have a great co-founder, awesome. But the thing I see that makes me nervous is when people feel pressure to go find a co-founder, which is, it's just such a long-term relationship. It's not something you want to jump into. And if you've already worked on your idea for long enough to have a lot of conviction that like this is something that could be big, you should just go through, raise the money, and hire a team around you. But Again, remember, if you're even earlier than that and you're like just really thinking about what you want to do and you have some uh, people you've worked with in the past, like reach out and see if one of them's willing to be a co-founder. Sometimes they aren't. Maybe they need an income, at which point it's actually very compelling to investors if you already have a bench you want to hire with the money you're going to raise. And a lot of people get it. They're like, yeah, not everyone can go not have a salary for a year or two. Uh, and someone would be happy to take a salary and only 15 or 20 points to the company rather than a little bit more because it's de-risked for them. And we've had this new thing happen in the last five years by call like the late joining co-founder, which is the co-founder that joins a year into the business after there's already a few people, but comes on and the founder decides that they're going to make this really important late joining employee a co-founder in title, if not in equity. And so we've seen a lot of that too of companies that I met a year ago. I'm like, wait a minute, now there's two of you as co-founders mm -hmm. and that person joined three or four months after the sort of product shift or company made some progress. Well, what does that mean? It just means they have as much equity as the actual? No, oftentimes I think it's more of an honorific. It's more to signify that person's, the cap table usually does not reflect the quality. Okay. The cap table usually reflects when the person showed up, but it ends up being an honorific or just a title that means something to the individual who gets it as a signal to the company about that person's importance. So you mentioned salaries, and I think it's something that a lot of people are interested in. At what point do co-founders or fa founders of early stage companies often start getting paid? Yeah. yeah. I mean, as someone who's been through this, I can say that there ends up being something of a chicken or egg situation that'll happen for people if they're just very, very early trying to decide if they want to start a company where they're like, I don't have the personal like financial stability to be able to go without a salary for some period of time. Mm -hmm. Like if that's the case, just work somewhere, save up. Like it's useful to have, you know, a hundred thousand bucks just personally that you can spend on your business and not be stressed about not savings, not something like that. Uh, and then as soon as you raise an institutional round, like you, uh, you know, one or $2 million, usually that's the point where you'll start paying yourself a little bit as a founder, but you really don't want to be in a situation where you like absolutely need that money. And you're like cutting a little too close, kind of like the whiteboard thing. You're going to be too stressed about personal financials and not focused on like what's most critical for your business. Yeah. Usually you should spend that money you raise to hire other people, maybe don't have as much of a cushion or aren't as risk seeking to like de-risk it for them and get them to come in and help you build the business. What do you think, Danny? Yeah, I agree. I mean, by the time you get to a, a, certainly a, a seed or a, a large series A, I'd be hard pressed to think of an example where a founder is not paying themselves. The question though is how much? And I think about it similar to what Russ was saying of, you're, you're paying yourself enough so that the basic costs of life and running your business are not giving you anxiety. Because as an, as an early stage investor, one of our primary roles is to try and keep like the baseline stress as low as it can be because it's really hard to go build a company. And so, no, at that point, you know, if a founder is coming in at a series A and they say, I'm gonna go pay myself $300,000, you're like, well, that doesn't really feel right. Shouldn't you want to put some of that money into the company, right? But we see people, you know, the ranges I've seen are anything from 60K up to probably 120 at a Series A, maybe 150. And then the expectation is as the company grows and as the balance sheet grows and it's de-risked, your um, salary as a, an executive at the company, a CEO of the company also will, will scale with that. At Precede, we sometimes have the opposite problem, which is people want to pay themselves too little. They say, oh, I'm only going to draw a salary of 50K. I go, that sounds really stressful in San Francisco. Like, is that a sustainable salary for you for the long term? And sometimes they might have a spouse who does really well and they say, hey, I can, I've made an arrangement. 
in our household, I can afford to draw 50K for a year. I just worry when people set themselves, and sometimes I think it's like a signaling thing. They want to signal that they're committed. Yeah. I'm like, I want you to actually be able to work on the company and to Russ's point, not have the financial stress impact how you run the business. So more often than not, I end up talking people up hmm. from low numbers to say, what's, like, what's the actual sustainable, no signaling, no posturing, like what do you actually need to get by and let's get you to that level as opposed to something that's like arbitrarily low that isn't really workable. What do you think is the average in the Bay Area? I don't, I tell everyone if, you, if a founder is making $10,000 a month or less, I will never question whether they're paying themselves too much. You get above that at the stage where I invest at pre-seed and seed, it's probably worth understanding. And we have people who do and they have life circumstances where like mm -hmm. it makes sense. And anything below five, I really question like, are you on a sustainable? So I'd probably say it's probably around 100K. Yep. It's probably, the, and I think it's also, that's just an easy number to model for people. <laughs> so it, it's, it has that benefit. Interesting. Okay, well, I want to talk about pitching. And I know you guys probably get questions about pitching so much, so you probably have answers down to a T. But what are the biggest mistakes people make, and what makes you actually reply to a cold pitch, or what makes you decide, hey, I actually want to meet this founder? Uh, well, I think it goes back maybe to the first question that you posed, which is what what the first the first filter to make is what kinds of companies are good fits for venture capital, and there's a set of companies that aren't a great fit for different funds of different sizes. So speaking for myself personally, right, we have a 400 million dollar early stage fund and also a growth fund that's later stage. But for an early stage fund of 400 million, our goal is to return that fund and have the opportunity to return the majority of it on any individual investment. And so when you run the math, you have to believe that any company you're investing in at the Series A can be a billion dollars or more in value, so that the approximately 20% of that business that you might buy could be returning a meaningful proportion, half if not more of your fund. And I remember when I first got into venture, I thought about that and I thought, this is crazy. There's so many incredible businesses out there that are making, they're printing cash, hundreds of millions of dollars, and you're telling me like those aren't a good fit for the fund. And now, having been in it for some time, that's actually the right answer. Um, and so that's the easiest way, right, where um, there are companies that, given the market usually that they're going after, they're going to be capped on what their outcome is going to be. Um, and so those are not really a good fit for a fund of our size. There are smaller funds where that is an excellent fit and absolutely where they could go raise money. So that's the easiest way to kind of cleave off some, some group. Then otherwise you say, okay, if you have um, a, a TAM that's big enough to support a big business, maybe you have a competitive landscape that is um, you know, indicating that there's an opportunity to build something, and that could be that there are existing companies that validate the need that you're solving and or you know, a shift in um, regulation or in consumer behavior or whatever else it is or data that exists online. Um, you're, you're kind of seeking for what's the white space opportunity, and then you're looking at who is the team of people that want to go build this, and do they have an earned perspective on, on going to solve the problem that they're trying to solve? Yeah. I think one really good point you're bringing up there is that as an entrepreneur, when they're pitching you, especially for their Series A, they need to understand what business you're in. Yeah. And a lot of people DQ themselves by like just missing what I would call table stakes in terms of like needing to fit your criteria. Yeah. And then once they fit that, you're, you're kind of looking for reasons to say no early on. And I assume it's the same for you, Charles, where yeah. there are some things you can do in pitching that would just DQ the company overall. And, and then once you check all those boxes, there's a whole additional set of things you need to think about in pitching in terms of giving yourself uh, the best foot forward and, and like, you know, really like catering to your own strengths. I think the two things I'd say is it's important to remember that like, Annie, you can do what, two or three investments a year as a Series A investor, like in a normal year? Yeah. So by definition, there's going to be amazing businesses that won't be in that elite tier of two to three, and we can do 20 to 25 a year. So sometimes there are really just interesting good businesses that are not at that intersection of good business and something I want to work on. And that's, that's an uncomfortable thing to say sometimes as an investor, but it's absolutely true. I'd say the other thing is we get a lot of cold pitches at Precursor. We like reading them. The number of times people send me an email and I read it twice, I'm like, I have zero idea what this company does. Like, I have no idea. It says mm -hmm. cloud, AI, machine learning. I'm like, what's the product? Like, what is the product? Like, what's the problem? So what I tell people is just be really simple and clear about what the product is and for whom. And I find that people who can't rattle that off fairly quickly usually more time spent with them does not produce 
more clarity and insight on the business. And so I'd say the number one thing you can do to get a VC's attention is make it really simple. This whole thing about elevator pitch, people joke about it. It's actually really important to be able to tell a really quick and concise story about your product, your customer, and why it matters to them. And um, there's a million things people do to DQ themselves once they get in the room, but I'd say that keeps half the cold pitches I get, I'm just like, well, I don't even understand what this is, so I'm not going to spend any more yeah. time on it. Yeah, that's yeah. good advice for pitching a reporter, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we actually see this in the data as well. Um, so the data, the uh, research we do is all opt-in by founders, and if anyone is a founder and you get an email from Docs, then please say yes, because it's super helpful to see this in aggregate. But a lot of the pitches that don't raise money, especially at the pre-seed stage, have a lot more time spent looking at product pages, and they have a lot more product pages in them. Yeah. And so the pitch deck you put together, we joke that there's the minimum viable product, but there's also the minimum viable PowerPoint, the MVP, yeah. PPT. Yeah. And that's what you're often sending around if you're a pre-idea to, to raise money. Like that deck is meant to just describe the basics of what you do. That deck doesn't need to prove that it could be a multi-billion dollar opportunity. And so sometimes people end up over-focusing on like why is it defensible or why is it a huge market? And they do that to the detriment of like, what is it that I'm actually doing to begin with? Like what's the real basics of my business? Mm -hmm. And you have to answer those questions first. So the, the decks that usually do the best are the ones where someone reads it and afterwards they say, this is obvious. They actually have less time spent reading them because the person reads it, Charles reads it, and he's like, I, I get what you mm -hmm. do. Yeah. Maybe I don't like the dry cleaning industry, yep. um, so I'm not gonna take the meeting, but I understand what you do. Or actually, I've got some more questions about the size and growth and other things, but like, let's dig on that in the first meeting. Okay, I'm getting a lot of questions in here about investing in um, untraditional markets. So I'm gonna combine some of them, but uh, what's the best way for a founder from a non-Silicon Valley market like the Midwest to get your attention? I've also seen one about uh, investment in India. How does an Indian founder get your attention? Um, and if you're say based in LA, how do you get SF investors attention? Uh, those are three different regions. Okay, LA, Midwest, and international markets, India being an example. Again, it's fun by fun, so you can start by looking at what other investments have it, has that group made, and do they have any sort of public statement on where do they invest? So for example, again, I'll use myself as an example, we historically have not invested outside of the US, though we have had another partner fund with the Red Plate brand that invests in China. Um, so you could start there. There are lots of other funds that have their own teams and brands that are based in India, for example, and that would presumably be where you might start. Um, for something in the US, so I, I think of, um, there are a few funds that I can think of that will only invest in the Bay Area, but most will invest, I think, across the US. Certainly we are one of those. About 50% of our current portfolio is outside of the Bay Area. Um, and so LA, you know, we, myself and many folks on the team are down there on a regular basis. I think the easiest way to, and um, the question was posed, get in front of the Bay Area investor is get in front of an LA investor because those relationships are actually pretty tight. Um, where I'll ping, you know, somebody in LA who's a seed investor or even another Series A investor and say, hey, what's going on down there? I'm coming down for two days. Who should I meet? Who should I see? Um, you know, and, and that's like an interesting way to get in and an easy thing because they're in your backyard. Um, in the Midwest, there's, that's a little bit more challenging. There are pockets where there are, you know, um, more and more opportunities for investment. You know, we have an investment um, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, for example, and there is like kind of an, a burgeoning new um, investment community there. And again, I think the same would hold. The other way to do it is if, you know, I'll get an email and literally a tactical piece of advice would be, hey, I'm going to be in town for these five days. And this is like, you know, three weeks from when I'm receiving the email. I'd love to sit down and talk with you about the company. Here's what we do. Maybe I attach a deck, maybe I attach a, a you know, blurb or something. And I'm often like, oh, great. Okay, I have this, you know, what happens in my mind is like, oh, I have a time bound um, like space on my calendar where I can meet this person. Let me do that while they're here. And quite frankly, where they're coming from is secondary to that. So that could be one like approach, um, but it probably does require a trip out. Yeah, we have investments in 19 states and four countries, so two in Mexico, three in Canada, one in Nigeria. Um, we have a really interesting relationship with non-Valley investors. I would say if you're in a well-developed venture hub, so San Francisco or New York, you shouldn't have too hard of a time finding access to VCs. Um, I find sometimes the companies that the local investors in some of those ecosystems like are not attractive to me and the companies that are not attractive to them end up being attractive to us. So we have companies in Chicago, Ohio, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, where they have actually relatively little support. And I think 
what I've come to believe is in some of these ecosystems, the local investors are very worried about who's going to do the next round. So they end up being kind of conservative in terms of the kinds of companies they send to me. Whereas I'm like, well, if I like the company, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to find a new round for them. So I'd say if you look at what converts for us, our portfolio company founders are a pretty good way to get in front of us. It's not the only way. I get actually a lot of really high quality referrals from founders who I met, passed on, but I liked them and I thought we had a decent conversation. So I think a little bit of connectivity is better than none, but if you really don't have any, if you can write a good cold email, it's actually a really good superpower and you shouldn't be afraid of it. But um, I don't know, We've, we, get, we get referrals from everywhere, lawyers, tax people, accelerators, local investors, and we've done an investment that's come through almost every channel. Yeah. I think to Charles's point, the, if you can find other founders who are VC backed, they already have good relationships with their mm -hmm. investors and they don't require the, the founder to like have done like a full diligence on the company. It's just if you can get a founder like me, I usually send our investors like a, a deal like every like week or two. Uh, and I like something about how they reached out to me or through a connection or something. And our investors will always read those pitches. So if you can do that, that's just a great way to get in front of them. And to your, both of your points, it doesn't really matter if the, you as a founder are in San Francisco or not. Uh, ironically, people in San Francisco still have the same problem of getting in front of investors. Uh, <laughs> even if you're geographically a block away from them, you know, everyone's busy. And so you need a reason to say yes, whether that's a really clear, concise pitch or an introduction through someone that they trust and like and can say nice things about you. I mean, it's funny. Literally, right before I got here, I met someone who was like, I'm in town for Disrupt. Can I meet you right before your panel? We can walk from coffee to nice. Moscone. And this is someone who's based in LA, who's like, I'm up for Disrupt. Are so. you going to invest? Uh, I really like the company. It's actually really cool, yeah. Awesome. Well, I want to talk about valuations. And um, for you, Charles, when you're investing at the pre-seed, uh, are you investing at pretty much the same valuation as long as it's the same deal size? Or how are you determining that? And how involved is the founder? We have a pretty narrow range. For, I mean, the way I think about it is pre-seed has to be a pretty significant discount from seed because most of the companies that we invest in are pre-launch, pre-product, pre-revenue. So that's a lot of pre's you have to cross off before you can go raise a seed round. So if, you know, it's, my guess is the median pre-money in our seed portfolio is somewhere between 10 and $12 million. So seed deals in, in major metros are become quite expensive. And Andy's cringing over here. <laughs> why, is there such a, why is there such a range of valuations at that stage, though? Because you do see, not necessarily just pre-seed, but seed and pre-seed, we're seeing larger and larger valuations, and then we're seeing some more conservative valuations. Yeah, I think part of what happens, so pre-seed, most, most of the company, if you said what's our, my guess is the median is probably between four and five pre. And I'm like, this is a, probably a fair discount. And what I will say is being cheaper doesn't make it more attractive to me. There are some companies that are too pre $2 million pre-money valuation because there's a lot of issues with the company. And like, I might prefer to invest for pre in a company that's a little farther along or has a clearer path forward than something at two pre that's like very, very nebulous. A lot of times it ends up being a function of two things, like competition and capital needs. And so we've had series, we've had seed rounds that have gotten very, very, very expensive, not based on the company's traction, but based on the seed investor's perception of that founders likelihood of being successful. Could be their prior background, could be the work that they did with very little capital, could be reputation, could be anything. Mm -hmm. And so the range, also seed funds are bigger now. Seed funds are 75 to 100 to 25 or a million larger. So the range of prices they can pay, to Annie's point, like their business model is to buy 10% of the round. If you have a $100 million fund and, the, and you want to pay 12 post, and the entrepreneur wants a $15 million post, and you want to buy 10%, it only, cost, it, only, it only costs you $300,000 more to meet them at that $15 million mm -hmm. price. And in a $100 million fund, are you going to stress over a $300,000 yeah. difference? Probably not. Are you hoping things level out? Because you're probably seeing more expensive deals at the A, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping things level out. <laughs> sure. Um, that's a selfish point of view, right? As an investor, of course, you're looking for opportunities to buy a piece of the company for what feels like a reasonable price. And to Charles's point, and you know, TechCrunch and others have posted a lot of great data on this about just the sheer number of both investors and dollars that are getting put to work right now. And so valuations are inflated, round sizes are inflated. You know, I've seen, you know, when I first started in venture, my first Series A checks were $3 million. And 
you know, I see Series A checks for 15 to 20 on a pretty regular basis now, and that's not that long ago. Um, and, and there's a lot of challenges with that, um, both for the investor community, but also for a, a company, right? There's a, there's a real risk to overcapitalizing your business, and there's a real risk to taking a valuation high, much, much higher than where you're going to be able to get to in that period of time, because then you can get stuck. And we haven't seen that many recently, though perhaps WeWork might be a, um, an interesting example, um, where you know, on a very large scale, a valuation far exceeded the fundamentals of the business, and then at some point there is nobody else to back that business. And I suspect that you know, that does happen at, at all stages. It's less public, certainly. But if you, you know, raise a $15 million Series A and you're sitting at 60 post, and then you're only able to get to a $5 million run rate or something like that, it's, you might actually have trouble raising more money at that valuation and you come down. And that's, that down round is, you know, it's kind of the nature of the experience. It's gonna, it happens a lot more often than anybody might think it does, but it's also not fun and it's not the best thing for the company. So if you're able to raise less to get yourself to the milestones that you wanna get to, you will have more success, presumably, in raising future rounds. Yeah. I think the other challenge, too, that we see is we'll invest in a company on a safe or, mm -hmm. an, or a convertible note, and they might raise $2 million in convertible notes before they get to a price seed round. The price seed round is $3 million. The reported number, which is accurate, is it's a $5 million seed round. He goes, oh my God. I'm like, well, the company only really had X. And I, I think it might have been Danny who wrote a really great piece on this in TechCrunch, mm -hmm. which is like reported round sizes. If you're not sort of intimately familiar with the company, the real question is how much new capital did that business get to work with? And it can be intimidating. And as an investor, I get these emails from our portfolio companies who yeah. say, my competitor just raised $7 million. I'm like, Your competitor actually just raised $3 million in new money the other four they had before, and this is sort of a cleanup financing to bring that all together. Mm. Yeah, and I think from the founder perspective, what you want to think about is how much are you spending relative to how much progress you're making. And if you're able to raise a bigger round at a higher valuation, just keep in mind that to get ahead of that, you, you might need to make that money last for longer. Um, there's another flip side of it too. Uh, we have some research coming out uh, today on, on this in TechCrunch around when founders have multiple term sheets or when they are in an oversubscribed round, which you know, as founders, we all want to be in that situation, right? Too many people trying to give you yeah. money. Deal terms don't actually matter that much. It's like less than 30% of uh, founders will go, with, like, will, will go with their lead investor over deal terms. In an oversubscribed round, if it's 20% or more oversubscribed, about 60% of founders at the seed and pre-seed stage report going with the first mover, the first person to give them a term sheet. Um, and almost 50% of founders, are, regardless if they're oversubscribed or not, will go with the lead investor who they feel like they have the best rapport with. Um, and I think it's only like 28% will say that brand was the biggest driver of them picking a lead investor. So what you're seeing in the numbers is founders like really like saying terms are like not as important to me and the relationship I have with this investor, the investor willing to go to bat for you for the next round of funding, even if that's like kind of a hard one as a bridge round or a down round or something like that. And then seeing eye to eye with that investor because once you have a lead investor, like you guys are, you're set, you're gonna be working together for a long time. So you wanna make sure you're picking the person you're gonna get along with the best. So to clarify, it's about the relationship, it's not about the speed in which the investor handed you the term sheet. Uh, it is both. So one of the stats was if the round was 20% or more oversubscribed, the founder will report, 60% of founders report that the uh, first mover is the person they picked as their lead investor. Hmm. Um, but then almost half across all of them will report that uh, the rapport they had with the investor was a leading like, cause of them picking them. So rapport you just end up seeing up high no matter what. Uh, and then there really is like an advantage to being the first mover. A lot more so though if it's an oversubscribed round and less so if it's not an oversubscribed round. If you just get the one term sheet and it's like okay, then you're going with the one term sheet and you'll be very happy about it. Right. Okay, well we have about six minutes left and I want to get through a bunch of these, so let's try to be quick, quick and get, get, get through some. Um, how often do you guys return cold emails? Would you say percentage? I have to ask our team because I don't see all of them. I try to do 75% of the ones that are good. And that's my bar. Like, it has to be well written. It can't be dear, dollar sign, first name. Like, it has to be, like, reasonably good. And I'm like, if the person put effort into writing it, I should read it and respond. Probably half. Okay. And it's similar of, like, if it feels like there was thought when they went into it. And do all pitches need to occur in person? 
God, no. We don't even have people come. San Francisco traffic is so bad. I tell people in the city, let's do the first one as a 30-minute Zoom, even if you're in San Francisco. It's going to take you 30 minutes to get to my office for a 30-minute meeting. That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Uh, another thing, uh, as a founder, like I actually have probably have a higher rate of responding because I just yeah. don't get as many pitches from people. <laughs> but if they're like, hey, this is, I'm working on something similar to what you worked on before. It's relevant to your, like what you had at Facebook. I'll just be curious. I'll be like, oh, what, what's their angle on it? Yeah. And then if they're like, and I know that one of your investors might be a good fit, I'll, I'll forward it on to them because they'll be like, hey, this is cool, relevant to what I did before. Um, so again, yeah, cold emailing a founder, depending on it, might actually have like a pretty high response rate too. And um, thoughts on managing options to early employees? In what, in what sense, like, manage, like how much equity to give out to early employees? Yeah. Um, I mean, you're, you're going to have more numbers across this. Our research hasn't really focused on this. I mean, I'll say you give a lot more to our early employees, and a lot of it, there's a pretty big range. There's also a lot of data on this, too. Um, a lot of companies will report uh, the equity levels, and so they're actually like pretty well-reported bands, depending on the job function and seniority. Mm -hmm. um, probably the ones that fall into the in-between zone are like those early, like kind of late co-founder ones, yeah. where you you actually have the option to give someone an outsized grant if you think you're going to have an outsized impact. Um, so, but yes, equity is one of those things where you want to spread it around so it motivates everyone, and everyone is excited on making the business whole. It's really hard because also every founder we work with has a different view on how tightly they want to hold on to equity and like yeah. how generous they want to be with the team. So I feel like my job is to learn that founders if you want an equity and give them reasonable advice based on like where they're coming from. What's your view on corporate VCs participating in early stage rounds? Oh, it's very problematic. Like strategics or just later stage? VCs coming down and participating? Um, I mean, it says corporate VCs, but I think, uh, like, uh, Annie, for you, I mean, you're, you're probably seeing that more than, than Charles would yeah. see it. Yeah. At the Series A, you see it a little bit, you see it a lot of the B. Yeah. Because the Series B is the stage where every company is noble, right? Like, there's been something written about it that people know they fundraise. So the Series B is where, like, the severe competition starts, I would say. Series A, sometimes it depends kind of how high profile the company might be. Um, so I think of you know, corporate VCs um, is different than a strategic <coughs> VC. So for example, like um, Sapphire Capital is SAP's corporate venture arm. They're great, they do a whole bunch of investing. I would have absolutely zero problem with them investing, co-investing or falling onto a round. There are strategic, and that's, that's because that's, that's their business and they understand what they're doing and they're going to be along for the ride. I think generally why strategic, sometimes called corporate VCs get a bad rep um, is because this is not their core business and they're just trying to put money into something that they might acquire later or they might um, want to learn from or they might want to have the brand for some reason. They're not going to help the company. They might, in fact, get in the way of the company. They might have different expectations for how that company should report to them. Um, and they, uh, they also might, most importantly, conflict that company out of working with other customers or companies in the ecosystem. So generally, uh, a strategic investor um, is, is not my first priority for a co-investor. And the biggest challenge we've had is human turnover, is that the people on these teams get reassigned, corporate priorities change, and you can sometimes mm -hmm. in a year have three different people from such and such strategic venture mm -hmm. group coming to the board meeting, and it's like really disruptive from continuity standpoint, mm -hmm. so. Um, and let's close on this one. Um, when pitching, is it better to lead with a large grand problem or the smaller problem that you're addressing first? This is one of the things that's hardest for our research to uncover because Every, there are some best practices we've already talked about in pitching, but there is something that is unique to every company, which is how do you craft a great narrative that highlights what you do and why it's unique? And so the answer is often it just depends. Like you know there are some check boxes you have to hit along the way, but the order in which you go through them really depends on really like the elevator pitch you have. Like if you're trying to describe to your good friends or family, like why are you quitting your how well paying job to like invest years of your life in this, like whatever you tell them to get them excited about it and understand you is probably the order you want to pitch it in. And sometimes it's like to Charles's point, like you might have the most stellar team on the planet or sometimes it's like we're actually already making a bunch of money or I've already closed four customers or it's so it just it just varies. Yeah. I also just think it depends on, are you in a well-known domain? So if you're in CRM or sales tech, or de like, if investors who invest in tech probably have some priors on your market, then you don't have to spend a lot of time telling me that like, cloud enterprise applications are a huge market. Like, whenever I see that side, I'm like, everybody knows this. You can take this side out of your deck. 
But if you're in some market where either software hasn't traditionally been present or investors haven't had a lot of exposure, you might actually need to spend a little bit more time contextualizing the industry that you're in and like why the problem's interesting. And so I think a lot of it just depends on like, are you in a known domain or like a unknown domain? The best pitch I've seen do this in the last year was a company that you literally gave me the first slide of choose your own adventure. You guys know those books, choose your yeah. own adventure mm -hmm. books, right? Like which way, right? it's like one of the most sold types of books in the US ever. And the first slide that he had was, okay, there are three things about my company that we should talk about. It was effectively like supply, demand, and market size. Where do you have the most questions? Where do you want to start? Okay, great, yeah, let's start with number two. And that was a really lovely way of doing it where it made the best use of our time and he learned something about me even in my like, first choice and it helped us have a really easy conversation the rest of the time. Great, well, thank you guys so much. Thank you for yeah, having me. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.